Good morning. morning. Great. Thank you so much. We, uh, if you want to open your Bible somewhere, we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture. We go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Kind of hold your spot there. We're starting... uh, 2024 with a series called Transformation. Uh, We're talking about actually following Jesus to become someone different. Uh, Our our, uh, mission statement is we learn about Jesus in order to live like Jesus so that we can lead other people to Jesus. It's a really simple yet a really uh, deep uh, statement. We do that through a discipleship process. And uh, Stephanie and I were, were in Nashville this past fall, and we had some friends there, and uh, we were talking about church and why people come to church and what churches do to get people to come to church. They'll bring in big names or entertainment or give things away and all the different uh, strategies, philosophies of that. Uh, and this young lady looked at us and she said, well, it all depends on why they're coming to your church. If they're coming for entertainment, you got to bring the big names. Uh, if they're coming as a consumer, you got to give something away. She said, but if they're coming for transformation, none of that matters. And I had to step back for a second and ask myself this question. Why are we coming? Are we coming to be changed, to be transformed into the image of Christ. And I want you to listen carefully because our minds do some weird stuff with this. Most people's church life works like this. We choose salvation. We don't choose transformation. Now, that's how our mind works. Here's the truth. When you choose salvation, transformation comes with it. You can't get one without the other. But in our minds, because of how all this is presented to us, it works like this. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Save me. I want to continue to live like I've always lived and still go to heaven. And yet when you read scripture, what you find out is salvation is always paired with transformation. So, but in reality, here's what, here's what I tell you. You have a lot of people who chose salvation, never chose transformation. So today you're going to be challenged to make sure you have chosen transformation in your life. We, uh, we use this wheel. Go ahead and grab it. We call this the pickle tray. It's uh, four shades green, pickle tray. It's easy to remember. We're not going to use it at all. We just needed something on the back. So uh, turn it over and reveal the blue side. Someone said, this is the shades of blue you're going to turn next week when that Arctic blast gets here. Uh, We are looking for names for the blue side. We would love to hear from you what we could name this uh, that's fitting for matching up with the pickle tray. This is what we're going to do the next four weeks. This is the stages of maturity, spiritual maturity, that we walk through on our way to discipleship. This is only the part that deals with us. And we're going to be working through that uh, for the next four weeks. And and it, it talks about maturity and expectation for those levels. So keep it with you for the next four weeks. Our single verse of Scripture that we're going to read today, and I am going to throw a lot out to you, so write these things down, but it's in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, where Paul was explaining to Timothy what discipleship looks like, and this is what he said. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach them to others also. So here it is. We learn about Jesus in order to live like Jesus so we can lead others to Jesus. What we learn, we want to be able to pass on. When we stop passing it on, Christianity is dead. Or it becomes twisted into something that doesn't represent Christianity anymore. That's our goal. Would you pray with me as we work our way through this today? Father, thank you. Uh, We humbly ask, Father, for light bulb moments today. Those moments when uh, what we thought we knew about you, Father, becomes clear, where we begin to understand. Father, where people are set free, where people begin to grow, where people truly understand the power of the Word of God. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, So spiritual life always begins with spiritual birth. So uh, to help you understand what spiritual life is like, biological life is our illustration of what happens in spiritual life. There are very, very, very clear stages of maturity with markers in biological life. A baby is born, they're an infant, they become a child, they become a teenager, a young adult, a median adult, a senior adult. There are markers all along the way. I'm a senior adult, here's a marker, right? You with me? 
right? You don't get this when you're 13, right? It's a marker of a stage of maturity. It is very, very clear in the world of biology. It is also clear in the world of spiritual life. There are markers. The Bible talks about spiritual birth. Spiritual infancy, spiritual childhood, and spiritual adulthood. There are clear markers for each of those. Well, where we start today is this. All life begins with birth. All life does. Spiritual life also begins with spiritual birth. Listen to what Scripture says. John 1, 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, here it is, who were born. Not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the will of God. 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. John 3, 3, truly I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. So this huge question becomes, what does it mean to be born again? And then we can overcomplicate this stuff, right? We, we can talk about it in terms where nobody can understand it. Here's all I want us to do today. I want us to look at biological birth, run some parallels with it, and learn three markers for spiritual birth so you can look at your life and go, I have or have not been born again. I have or have not been born again. So here we go. First one, a birth is an event or an experience. It's a very clear event or experience. We will soon have nine grandbabies in our life. We have six kids in our life. I have been part of a lot of births, a whole lot of births. And there's some things all these births have in common. They're all celebrated. Everybody gathers down at the hospital. It's a big deal when new life happens. It's so big that we commemorate it every year, right? We throw parties every year. Even senior adults are still having parties because the day you got life was a big day. We should take a lesson from that about spiritual life because here's reality. Your biological life's going to end and your spiritual life's not. We don't celebrate it. We don't commemorate it the way we do biological life. Just again, simple, simple, simple lesson because a birth we celebrate because a birth means something miraculous has happened, right? Uh, I've been a part of a lot of them. I've never seen one that wasn't miraculous. And you go, well, I'm a scientist. I can explain it to you. It's still a miracle, right? There was no life. There was nothing. Now there's life. That's pretty miraculous. That's miraculous in the biological world, but it's also miraculous in the spiritual world. There was no life, and there was life. That's something on the God side of the equation that's miraculous. Birth means something that did not exist, now exists. There was an event, a moment in time when something happened. So of the six kids and the eight grandkids on the ground right now, we never once did this. Where'd that kid come from? (laughs) Uh, That kid wasn't there a minute ago. What happened, right? No, no. We knew when birth happened. We celebrated. We longed for birth to happen. We were so excited about birth, about the birth that was happening. So here's a question. There was a definite moment in in life when life began. It was an event. It was an experience. So here's the first question for you. Has there ever been a moment in your life when something spiritual happened to you that you cannot explain? Something that wasn't became something that was. There was no life, now there is life. If you want to use the word miraculous, I'm fine with that. Something miraculous happened to me. An event and an experience. The second thing, um, the, a birth means that new life has begun. The word in the New Testament that is, is most often used to describe what happens in our life is the word new. New. Something exists that didn't exist before. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Galatians 6, 15 describes the follower of Jesus as a new creation. Romans 6, 6 says we walk in newness of life. Ephesians 4, 24 tells us to put on the new self in the likeness of God. So something that has never existed now exists. Something that's new, something's different. So here's my question. Because of your new birth, is something different about you? 
Is there something about you that is true now that's never been true before? And, and again, again, we're, we're pushing in heavy on this. If the only thing you can look at and say that's different is that you go to church on Sunday, probably not the kind of difference we're talking about. We're talking about a difference in passion, personality, pursuits. A different you now exists because of a spiritual birth that happened in life. And then the last one, new life is an act of love initiated by God. Okay, so in God's perfect plan, this is how it would always have looked, starting with Adam and Eve. Hey, I love you. Let's get married. Let's have, okay, y'all got to get on board with me. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes the baby carriage, right? Okay, so you are on board. In God's perfect plan, that's the way it would always work. Love would have always preceded birth, but we live in a fallen world. And love does not always precede birth. It's part, it's part of the harsh world we live in. But in the spiritual world, always it will be true that your spiritual birth was initiated by the love of God himself. It doesn't happen unless it's, it happens because he loved us. The scripture even says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the question becomes, have you been born again? Has there been an event and an experience in your life that resulted in a new you? Different than the old you. Different than the old you. An act preceded and initiated by the love of God that changed your life forever. If not, you'll get a chance to do that. Choose that today, right? For some of us, it's a journey. Some of us have been on that journey for a long time. God's just been working it a little bit at a time. Maybe today is the day that comes full circle in your life. So after birth, we become an infant. And infancy is a stage of learning. I need you to listen to this, especially if you've been around church a long time. A child's brain develops faster in the first five years of life than any other time in life, right? So a great illustration of this is why languages are so easy. A child under five can be multilingual. A dude 63 years old can do well only to speak one language and masquerade it at times. You with me? is that the fastest stage of learning is the stage of infancy in biology, but that's also true spiritually. Follow me in this. That what is neglected in the first five years of life almost never catches up the rest of life. Stay with me. If you are hurt or injured in the first five years of life, you carry it with you the rest of your life. Stay with me. We're still talking biology. As a matter of fact, watch this. Hear me. In the biological world, you neglect or abuse anybody in that infancy stage, you go into jail. It's that big a deal. And I would tell you that the church stands guilty before God for the neglect and the abuse of infants in Jesus because this is what it looked like. Hey, come on down the aisle so you don't go to hell. Well, what do I do now? I don't know. Good luck. And there would be people, listen, there would be people all over this auditorium if you said, look, I made the decision to follow Jesus and got dropped like a hot rock. And you never catch up. Because nobody sat down and said, listen, this is how you grow. And here's what happened. Here's what happened to me. I didn't want to go to hell. But my life... My life was still frustrating me. I was still doing things that a person who followed Jesus should never do because I didn't know how not to. All I knew is I didn't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Nobody ever taught me what it means to be transformed and actually follow Jesus. So if there are two things that we expect you to do if you're an infant, you say, man, I am getting started. And the truth is, you may have said you've known Jesus for years and never gotten started. This is where you are. There are two things we want from you. Show up and read and listen. Show up and read and listen. So the first thing we want you to do is read the Bible. If you are uh, part of this church, we use the Bible reading plan. We will read Luke 6 on Monday. We read one chapter a day, Five days a week. You get Saturday and Sunday off, right? Because then you come up here on Sunday, so you really only get Saturday off. <laughs> then we use the acronym ROAD, R-O-A-D. Read, observe, apply, and do. And we journal. Read. On this week, I read Luke 3. 
Luke 3 was about John the Baptist. So I wrote, read Luke 3. Observe, John the Baptist was a weird dude. That's what I wrote. <laughs> he ate locusts. He wore camel skin. Now, I'll be honest with you. I would have probably never said he was weird unless I had read in a commentary, which I did, that a commentator said, he's a weird dude. Then I felt like I could say it and not get struck down. <laughs> so he's a weird dude. Read, observe, apply. God uses weird people. And I write them off. I have a tendency, if you don't look the way I want you to look and act the way I want you to act, that I will write you off and don't see your usefulness in God's kingdom. There was my application. My do, God forgive me and help me to love weird people. Right? Look, if you ain't got some weird people in your life, you, you be praying that prayer too, right? I mean, it's that simple. Read, observe, apply, and do. You say, well, that's a little complicated for me. We, we had 750 adult books and I don't know how many children's books. Well, they are gone. Otherwise, we've been telling people to go to the Hub today. For five bucks, you can pick up a book that will walk you through all this. It's called the Foundations Book. There will be 250 of them in the house tomorrow. I've had people ask me, can I just swing by and get it? Sure you can. Give UPS, or, uh, yeah, the UPS guy time to get here, uh, and, and we'll have them for you. We will have them next week in all of our services if you want to pick one up to walk you through that. It doesn't matter. You say, well, I missed the first of the year. Who cares? Who cares if you missed the first of the year? Get started. Start right where you are. And start spending some time in God's word. Second thing, attend and listen. We want you to be a part of everything you can be a part of. Show up for every worship service, men's group, women's group, whatever you can be a part of. Just show up and be there. That's what a baby does. We don't expect more of them than that. So uh, I heard the story about this, uh, about this guy who went to the opera. And uh, he had never been to the opera. And the lady who sang at the opera, she, she could sing incredibly. It was just the most beautiful thing he had ever heard. And so uh, every night that the opera was in town, he went back and he bought tickets and he showed up and he would try to get front row seats. And he was just mesmerized by this woman's voice. It was incredibly beautiful. And uh, the, uh, the opera left town and he decides that uh, he will write her. And so he writes her this letter. He never expected her to answer, but she did. And they start answering back, writing back and forth. He writes, she answers, she writes, he answers. And over the course of time, they start to kind of fall in love. And, and one day in one of the letters that he wrote, he said, man, I would love to spend the rest of my life with a woman like you. I, I could marry you. And she said, if you could, I will. And so they get married, and, and they really have never even been around each other, just wrote letters back and forth. And so the night of the honeymoon comes, and she's getting all ready, and she's going to make her grand entrance to the honeymoon. And she comes out, and she pops her glass eye out and lays it on the nightstand by the bed. And he's a little, little set back by that, but, you know. Then she takes off her wig, puts it on one of those styrofoam heads, Pops out her hearing aid, reaches down, unstraps her peg leg. <laughs> reaches up in her mouth and takes her false teeth out and lays them on the bed stand, uh, beside the bed there. And he is now in just utter, utter shock at what he's married. And he looks at her and he said, sing, woman, sing. <laughs> so look at me and hear what I'm telling you. You can't love what you don't know. You cannot love what you don't know. What is all this about? This is about knowing God so we can fall in love with him. This is not about checking a box. It's not about legalism. The God's word is the way we get to know God, you are beginning a love relationship with Jesus. You want to know all you can know about him so you can fall more deeply in love with him. And the more you know, the deeper your love will be. So what does that look like in daily life for me? Listen carefully to this. How do I spend my time in God's word? So pick up that road reading plan, right? This is it. They're all over the building. They're online. We've made them available everywhere. If you don't go to church here and you would like one, they are online at our website. Reach out to us. We'll send you whatever we can to get you growing in God's word. So you can pick this up, you follow this, you do the little ROAD outline, all the instructions. If you flip it over on this side, it tells you exactly how to do it. Next week, Matthew's gonna be teaching a class at eight and 11.45 on how to journal. We're doing everything we can to help you take that step 
to spiritual growth. But I'm going to give you four things to close this out. Number one, when you read God's word, read it in digestible bites. Um, the reason so many people don't read is they try to do too much too quickly. So uh, most of us are built for guilt and the church uses guilt to motivate people all the time and it's a poor motivator. And so this is what guilt looks like. You're going to read the Bible through this year. Well, I'm going to tell you what that looks like. That looks about like four chapters a day. That's too much. You will not make it. You miss one day. You got eight chapters to read. You're not going to make it. And it's, a, it's such a horrible experience that this is what you do. Well, I couldn't do that. I just, I quit. I'll just keep showing up for church, but I never spend any time in God's word. So let's compare again, spiritual life to biological life. When you eat, they bring you a big old steak out. You do not pick that steak up, that entire steak and cram it down your throat. It becomes an unpleasant experience. And you say something like this. I don't like steak. That is not true. You don't like steak eating it the way you tried to eat it. You with me? So what is it, what, what's a good steak experience look like? That's why they bring you a knife. And you cut off a digestible bite. And you let that thing sit in your mouth. And you savor it. You eat it slow. If you're like me, you try to leave some so you can take it home and eat it again later, Right? Right? It's not that complicated. We've made it that complicated. So when you read God's word, we're going to read John, or Luke 6 tomorrow. You're reading through that, and if one verse reaches out and gets you one verse, one verse, you stop. Because that's what God wanted you to have right then. And you write down, man, God gave me this verse today. I didn't have to read any further. This was my digestible bite for today. I got what I needed spiritually for my time in God's word. And some days, some days you're going to wake up hungrier than others. That's just biological life. And you say, well, I need more. Well, read all you want to read. <laughs> Nobody cares. But some days, and nobody ever talks about this, you're going to wake up and you're not going to be hungry at all. And then you eat because you know you need to. Just like life. If I don't eat something, I'm going to get sick or I'm going to die. And I may not feel like eating, but I eat today because I need to eat. Right, you with me? Okay. Number two, we read consistently. Small digestible bites every day, multiple times a day if necessary, right? If you're expecting to be spiritually sustained on the 28 minutes you get here every week, you're not going to make it. You, know, you want me to show you what that looks like? That looks like you hear, you hear a sermon and you decide you're going to change something, right? And it's changed and you're doing good till Tuesday. Tuesday, you're right back where you started. Why, why Tuesday? Because you're still trying to live off the 28 minutes you got here. And what we need to do is have digestible bites every day, right? If I expect to make Tuesday, I better be eating on Monday. And if I expect to eat, uh, make, make it on Wednesday, I better be eating on Tuesday, right? Is that it takes food every day to live this life. Number three, read to discover. We're not reading to cover ground. We're reading to break the ground of our hearts. We're not reading to check the box. We're reading to change lives. You realize the devil quoted scripture to Jesus, Right? Uh, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. And um, I need you to understand that biblical knowledge doesn't equal spiritual maturity. Some of the jerkiest people I know have a lot of biblical knowledge. Try to talk to them about it and you'll see. Right? They're rude. Uh, they're unlikable. Uh, because they've built this great, vast knowledge up here in the head, but it's never conformed them to the image of Christ. There's no kindness there. There's no graciousness. There's no gentleness. There's no peacefulness. Biblical knowledge does not equate to spiritual maturity. And listen, it doesn't do you any good at all to say you've read the Bible through in this year, the entire Bible, if it didn't change who you are. It did you zero good. You might as well have been read, reading something else. As to spend that time and not let it have its work in your life. So read in Digestible Bites. Uh, read it consistently. Read it to discover. Ask questions, right? Uh, ask questions about what, did, what does this say? What did I learn about God in this? What did I learn about sin in this? What did I learn about grace? 
in this. And then the last thing, uh, we read it for life change. That We go back to the journal, read, observe, apply, and do. The last thing is a do. What does the do look like? What is going to be true about my life because I spent this time in God's Word today, because I digested this uh, bite from God's Word, uh, what's going to be true about my life now? So sometimes that comes out as a prayer. I'm going to go back to my deal. God, help me to love weird people. Help me to stop writing them off. Help me to see their value in the kingdom, God, because they don't look like, dress like, or act like I think they should. God, help me to love them anyway. That's a prayer. Right? Sometimes it's a praise that would look like this. God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you use somebody weird like me. Right? And you go, well, you're not weird. You just don't know me. He knows. (laughs) Third thing. Sometimes, sometimes it's an imperative statement. God, by your grace, I will never. You fill in the blank. Or I will always. A declaration. What am I going to do? Because of this time I spent with you. So this is, close your Bibles, we're done. And look up here at me. Um, We're about to make a decision. And you say, well, pastor, I'm not ready to make a decision. Everybody in the room is going to make a decision. Everybody in the room, if you're one of those uh, resistant, uh, unpliable people and you're going, no, I'm not, watch me, you just did. (laughs) Right? You just did. Um, So so what I'd like for you to do is really think about the decision you're going to make rather than react to it. Um, If you came to Jesus to miss hell and gain heaven and nothing about your life changed, I pray you'd reconsider that today. I pray that you'd look at your life and go, wow, I cannot separate salvation from transformation. That if I'm going to make heaven, I'm going to be like Jesus. And that you'd take one step. This is not guilt. Take one step, one step, one step toward that transformation process. Just one thing. Make your walk with Jesus real. Follow him. Follow him. Follow him. Would you bow your heads with me? I, uh, I pray. I mean, I, I love the way God works. We had some stuff happen in the last service that was amazing uh, with some people's lives that were changing. And, I, and, and you know what? The truth is it didn't happen this morning. It had been happening for a long time. And that's probably true of your life. Maybe you showed up today and God has been working for a really long time in your life. And as he's been working in your life, maybe today's the day when that fruit becomes ripe. When you sit there and you think, I can't sit here any longer. I got to do something. I can't keep living this way any longer. I got to do something. I've had a great dose of church. I've not really had a dose of Jesus yet. And if that's true, Victor is here. I'm here. Matthew's here. Our ministry staff is here. You, you step out today. Let us pray with you. If, if life is overwhelming you and you say, I, I, I just need somebody to come alongside of me and lift me up, step out. Let us pray with you. Let us pray with you. This is our response time. And our God is so big, he speaks things that we didn't even scratch the surface of today. And if you're dealing with them, let us come alongside of you. Father, thank you so much for our time together. I pray, I pray that you'd be lifted up. Father, glorified, magnified. Father, that you'd find your people's hearts soft today. In Jesus' name. Amen.